Well, as you can tell from the title slide, we are in the study of Revelation, the book of Revelation. And we are in the second session. We had a little introduction in the previous section, sort of reviewed a lot of broad principles. We have quite a few new people, so you'll be gratified to know there will be quite a bit of review as we get started. And we're going to focus still on chapter 1. So you really, uh, by joining us in this session, you'll be able to catch up pretty quickly. It's the apocalypse. It, it's the catastrophic end crisis of our present age. So it takes, attracts a lot of attention. And of course, it's going to involve the spectacular appearance of the King of Kings taking over his global empire. He paid for it on the cross. He takes possession of it in this astonishing book. We're also going to see the internment of Satan into the Abuso. And all, we'll get into all those spooky uh, aspects as we get into that. And of course, we'll deal with the millennial return on the earth and the reign of Jesus Christ. That's very controversial. Uh, I think it's unfortunate, of course, that probably nine out of ten of the denominational churches uh, don't believe in a literal millennium. That's their view. They have their reasons. But uh, we have a different view. We'll try to g explain some of those things, and we'll share with you why we hold the view we do. And I might mention right here, it's not our desire to create controversy or to sell a particular viewpoint. What we're, our real goal here is to get you to do serious study of the Bible in general, and this book in particular, uh, as a serious student. We will share our views and why we hold those views, but all, underscoring it all, all along the way, we encourage you to do your own homework. And of course, we will see the final insurrection and the abolition of sin, and uh, a new heaven and a new earth. Interesting. A new heaven as well as a new earth. The redemption is, involves far more than just you and me personally. Far more than just the believers. There's far more going on here. But just to reiterate, the fundamental foundation of this ministry hinges on two discoveries. The first discovery is that this book, that we, these 66 books that we glibly call the Bible, are actually 66 separate books that were penned by over 40 different guys over thousands of years. The discovery is that we now discover it's an integrated message system, and I don't mean just thematically. Every detail, every number, every place name, even the mathematical structures underneath the text exhibit very skillful design. That's the first discovery. The second one derives from that. That design had to emerge from outside space-time because it anticipates things before they happen in structure as well as content. And uh, that implies that the author of these segments uh, emerged from outside our constraints of time itself. Once you discover those two things for yourself, it will change your whole perspective of the Bible. And uh, it, it will lead you to an awe that's essential to really understand it. Now, the central themes, of course, the Old Testament is an, is an account of the nation. The New Testament is the account of a man, a very specific man. The Creator Himself became man. And, of course, His appearance is the central event of all history. And, uh, you know, Mel Gibson did a fabulous job with his movie, The Passion, in, in its graphics and its in, in, in aspects of it. But it fails to really communicate who he was. The crucifixion of Christ was not a tragedy, it was an achievement. Dozens and dozens of prophecies fulfilled on that one day that were written centuries before. He died to purchase you and me. And the good news is he's alive right now as we speak. And our most exalted privilege is to know him. That's what the Bible's all about. That's what these sessions are all about. So this is by way of just a warm-up. But let's do something with our presuppositions. We all bring to this evening various presuppositions. Let's first of all recognize God means what he says and says what he means. And that sounds so simple, but it's so fundamental. The Bible is an integrated whole. Every detail is there by design, and uh, nothing is trivial. All things are there for our learning. We're going to show you a lot of things that seem trivial at first, but hopefully show you why they're not trivial at all. And God, of course, is his own interpreter, not Chuck Missler or some radio preacher or whatever, God himself. And our challenge is to find out what he really means. Now, in the early days of my ministry, I used to make everybody put this at the top of their notepad. I think I'll do this again. And this is a, a warning. In Acts 17.11, Paul leaves the Thessalonians goes down to Berea, and he speaks of the people down in Berea. He said, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. In both groups accepted him broadly. But the Bereans, he said, were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that 
They received the word, the word of God, with all readiness or openness of mind. But they searched the scriptures daily to prove whether those things were so. That's where Luke is telling you, don't believe anything Chuck Mister tells you. Check it out for yourself. And, and my intent is to get you to study, not to accept my particular views. I share my views in the sense they may be helpful, but also that you will know where at least I'm coming from. You may not agree, that's fine. Do your own homework. Now, there are different views of this book. There's the preterist view. They say that the, the, the meaning of this book was good only for the time it was written, the era of John and so forth. That's their view. There's also another view that's closely related, a historical view, that this has all been historically completed. And those are views you'll find books written with that perspe perspective. A larger number of books probably are, are, uh, regard the entire book as allegorical. The fight between good and evil and all these things are just allegories. And some people would call that the idealist view. And uh, there are allegories in the scripture, of course, but this goes far beyond just that. The fourth view, and the one we obviously are embracing, is what some people would call futurist. We believe this Bible is what it says it is, and it says the book of Revelation claims to be prophecy, and we believe it is. In fact, I think we can demonstrate it as we go. But these are four classic views. You should be aware that there are different views. The book of Revelation itself claims to be a prophetic book in many, many places, more than just the few I've listed here. Why prophecy? We're all interested in prophecy. Well, the Old Testament has over almost 2,000 references to Christ's rule on the earth, not just his first com coming. There are so many references to his first coming, that's why many of the Jews, when he made his appearance, didn't recognize him, because they're so fixated on, the, on uh, 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 Jesus, the son of David. And they speak of uh, the uh, uh, Messiah ben uh, Yosef, the suffering servant, is a different guy. No, they never realized it was both the same guy. There are 17 of the 39 books of the Old Testament that give prominence to the event. And uh, the New Testament, of course, is, uh, has 216, out of 216 chapters, there are 318 references to the second coming of Christ. Not the first coming, second coming. And it's mentioned in 23 of the 27 books. And the, the three that don't mention are, simp are a little single chapter books written to an individual. It doesn't fit the context. So it's a very dominant, dominant issue. And uh, so... See, you and I tend to presume that tomorrow will be like yesterday, next week like last week, next month like last week. We tend to linearly extrapolate life. It's natural. And we, th we tend to have a linear presumption in mathematical terms. Well, the Bible says quite otherwise. For every prophecy uh, relating to his first coming, there are eight prophecies of his second coming. It has far more visibility than even the first coming. Well, we're going to go through chapter 1. We started a little bit last time. The first three verses, I think, we touched on. That's the introduction to the book. And uh, from 4 to 11, we have a salutation and the occasion. What caused John to write this book? But then 12 to 18 is a vision of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. And that may surprise you to study it carefully. Then we have something that's unique to this book. I don't know of any other book in the Bible that has an outline. Usually, that's the teacher who assigns you to do an outline of the book you're studying. John gives you an outline to the book in verse 19. We'll take a look at that. And then we have a prep. The last verse is a preparation for your next few sessions, uh, chapters 2 and 3. But the introduction we'll start with. The revelation, notice it's singular, not plural. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto whom? Unto Jesus Christ. Think about that a minute. Many people read that first sentence and don't realize what it's saying. The, revel the unveiling of Jesus Christ that God gave to whom? To Jesus Christ. The Father gave the Son. Why? To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. That word shortly or quickly, we'll run into that a lot in the book. It comes from a Greek word, the same Greek root from which we get the word tachometer. And what a, a better translation really would be suddenly. It doesn't mean shortly in the sense it's going to be the day after tomorrow. But it, when, when one thing happened, they're all going to come right quickly together. It's a, a, they're grouped in a sense. That's really the intent, of, I, believe, I believe, of the passage. To show in his service things which must suddenly come to pass. And he sent and signified it, signified it by his angel unto his servant John. It was given to Jesus Christ, and he sent and signified it. What do I mean by signified? Rendered it into signs. Uh, idioms, uh, emblems, what have you. And he signified it by his angel or messenger unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things he what? 
he saw. We're going to be constantly confronted with visual images. Many of those images will be idiomatic. We'll get to that when we get there. But this, is, this, is, this isn't a, a abstruse philosophical paper. It's a drama that's going to unfold before his eyes. Now the basic units, you know, if we talk of written language, what's the basic unit of written language? An alphabet. If you would take Greek or Russian or English, you have the first thing you've got to master is the alphabet. It's the basic units of written language. If you're going to study sound, uh, Josh and the guys that do the editing of, uh, uh, of these tapes deal with very elaborate software that breaks the sound in, in, into its individual phonemes. It's the smallest element. If you have an image, most of us are familiar with the vocabulary of images today because of digital cameras. What's the smallest element of an image? A pixel. These are elements. Well, what's the basic unit of meaning? Not sound or language, but meaning. It's called a semime in, in information sciences. It's the smallest image. It comes from the Greek word semeno or sema, which is translated a mark. But that same Greek word that's used in this book uh, over 4,000 times is the basic unit from which we draw in science, the basic unit of meaning. And that means, I mean, to give a sign or signify, to indicate, or to make known. It's the basic element of that. Now, the book also has a promise in it that is unique in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible is there the, uh, the audacity to say, read me, I'm special. No book in the Bible reaches that far. Many places say, read the Bible, but only one book has, if I use the term audacity, or chutzpah, if you will, uh, to say, read me, I'm special. This book says, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. You can't find that appellation on any other kind of, any other passage in the scripture, I don't believe. And keep those things, which, which hear these, the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, one thing you'll notice all through, the, everybody that, anybody's, looked at the book at all, even superficially, realized that there are sevens everywhere. We're going to be confronted with seven churches in the next few sessions. We're going to have seven seals of a book, a, roll, a scroll open, the major part of the book. Seven trumpets will be blown, seven bowls. And in fact, this heptatic structure, the seven sealed scroll um, has, uh, we'll always notice, by the way, the, uh, of the scroll, of these, uh, this heptatic structure, there'll be six things, a break, and then a seventh. There are six seals sealed one at a time, and then there's a change of subject. It says, it's almost as if, as a reader needs to catch your breath. And we have a chapter 7 thrown in there on another subject. And then we have the seventh seal, which leads then to seven trumpets. And again, we have six trumpets, and then we, then we have a little parenthetical series of chapters that change the subject before we pick up that seventh trumpet again, and we go through, and we have bowls being, bowls of wrath being poured out. And even there, there's a little one verse parenthesis between the sixth and the seventh. But this, this heptatic structure, heptatic or sevenfold structure, is all through the book. There are seven lampstands, seven spirits, seven stars, seven lamps, seven title pairs, seven promises of the overcomer, seven horns, seven eyes. It goes on. Seven angels. We talk a lot about those in a little bit. Seven thunders, seven thousand, seven heads, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven mountains, seven kings. There are seven beatitudes. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear. We saw one already, a, ble a, a beatitude, a blessing. Blessed, is, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord in chapter 14. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments in chapter 16. How many beatitudes? Seven again. If, if you ask you how many and you answer seven, you'll be right, you know, more often than not. Blessed and only is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Blessed is he that keepeth the words and the prophecy of this book. That same promise that we saw in verse 3 is repeated in chapter 22, verse 7. Blessed are they that wash their robes. There are seven of these. There are more subtle sevens that most people would miss unless you're really watching for them. There are seven features in chapter 1. There are seven letter divisions. Not only are there seven letters, each letter, there are seven elements that make up the letters. We'll look at that. There are seven personages in chapters 12 and 13. A woman, a man-child, a red dragon, a seven-headed beast, the false prophet, the Michael, the archangel, and then the lamb. There are seven players in this drama that is summarized for you in chapters 12 and 13. There are seven years of judgment. Uh, there are seven I am's of Jesus Christ. And there are seven doxologies in heaven. Seven new things at the end. I don't think you could list all the sevens. I've listed I've, close to a hundred of them. And I, th and I have the feeling that if you look, you never end finding more and more subtle ones, but seven's always emerging. There's another thing that you should be familiar with as a, as a serious Bible student, and that's what we call types. 
The more contemporary vocabulary, we call it a model, but the classical literary word is, is a type. Uh, the Abraham's offering of Isaac in Genesis 22 is the classic uh, uh, type, the Akidah, the Jews call it. Nebuchadnezzar's image, the fiery furnace, is a, is a type of the tribulation and so forth in the minds of many. The whole book of Ruth and the redemption of the land. Uh, the, uh, the Ruth is full of uh, as, uh, aspects of that. The whole book of Revelation is modeled for you in the book of Joshua. If you study the book of Joshua, how it's structured. Where another Yehoshua dispossessed the land of its usurpers on the behalf of the people of God and so forth. It's astonishing to make a list of the parallels in structure of Joshua and the book of Revelation. And the tabernacle, those of you who studied Exodus carefully, they're studying the tabernacle. Its materials, its dimensions, uh, it, and the architecture all speaks of Jesus Christ personally. It's a fabulous study to get into. And uh, the brazen serpent is another one. Remember the brazen serpent? We'll, we'll, we'll examine that one later this evening to show it, make another point. But these are all types, as we call it. And, uh, idioms. You know, there's an idiom. Abraham is called the friend of God, you may recall. And because of that, God reveals to him, as a symbol of that friendship, what's going to happen. Remember in Genesis 18 and so forth. So Abraham is called a friend of God, okay? Who in the New Testament was called a friend of God? The disciples, right. And so, it's interesting. So we see linkage, both in the Old New Testament, the concept of friendship with the concept of letting you know what's coming. See? Well, let's take that one step further. Um, which prophet in the Old Testament was called the beloved prophet? Daniel. Sure, exactly. And, uh, who, and, and of the disciples, who was called the beloved disciple? What do they have in common? Apocalyptic writings. Isn't that interesting? Not a big deal, but you see the patterning I'm suggesting here. Okay. The other, now, one of the questions we'll all have is how do you keep from getting deceived? How do you keep from getting down the wrong path? One way is to rely on the whole counsel of God. Always put Christ in the center of it, and we'll, we'll show you how that works as we go. Uh, Peter even warned us that we have something even better than being an eyewitness. That's the more sure word of prophecy. Jesus challenged us in John 5, search the scriptures, and they are they which testify of me. He says, here's the scriptures, and in them you think you have eternal life? They are they which testify of me. So Jesus Christ is what the Bible is all about from cover to cover. And so if you have a problem, you can't figure it out, put Christ in the middle of it and see what happens. In Psalm 40, he says, the volume of the book is written of me, and indeed it was. And, and in Revelation itself is going to identify the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, all prophecy. And we pray for this every time we say the Lord's Prayer. It's astonishing that how many denominational churches use the Lord's Prayer in their services. And when you say, thy kingdom come, what on earth do they mean? They're not sure, frankly. Because what we're praying for is exactly what Revelation is all about. And we'll move on. We'll find certain phrases occur again and again as sort of markers through the book. This phrase, thunders, voices, lightnings, and an earthquake, occurs not once, four times. It causes certain partitions that we'll take a look at when the time comes. And there's doxologies. And they start off small. And they, it's like a symphony. It builds up in crescendo. First, it's glory and dominion in, verse, in chapter 1. Then it's glory, honor, and power in chapter 4. Blessing, honor, glory, and power. Four times different things in 5. Finally, it gets to how, how much? 7, of course. Blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might. Okay? And if you're going to, let me, let me put you at ease. We're not going to examine each one of those and how they differ. Okay? We'll let you do that on your own. What's the difference between blessing, glory, wisdom? You know, they're very similar, and yet they're different. I'll let you do your own word studies. Let's move on. Worship. There's all kinds of songs in here. Holy, holy, holy in chapter 4. Worthy art thou. That's repeated in so many ways in so many places. And it goes on. There's how, how many different uh, uh, worship songs are there? Seven. Good for you. Okay, good guess. Yeah. All right. Oh, one thing I always love about four, four hallelujahs. There are four hallelujahs in the New Testament. There are 24 hallelujahs in the Old Testament. And as often as the case, when you put them together, it's always a multiple of seven. There are many multiples of seven that only occur if you put the Old New Testament together. It's almost like they're stitched together because of that property, the heptatic structure again. But we'll move on. There are four things out of place in the book of Revelation, and we're going to get, put them in the right place. Israel is not in the land. It gets, gets the land in, in Revelation. The church is on the earth. It belongs in heaven. The lamb is not on his own throne. He's on his father's throne. He's going to take the throne that Gabriel promised Mary in Luke 1. David's throne. 
He's going to take that. And Satan is loose and he'll be bound. So these are all corrections or resolutions that take place. There are three women in, prominent in the book. The wife of yod heh vav or Jehovah, or however you want to pronounce it. She is summarized in chapter 12. That's not the church. I'll show you why when we get there. It's Israel. The, is, the church is it. It's the virgin bride, the bride of Christ. She's portrayed quite differently. If the woman in chapter 12 is, is uh, the church, she's in big trouble. Because she's a virgin bride that's pregnant. The idiom doesn't quite work, okay? And for a lot of other reasons too. No, the virgin bride is the bride of Christ. That's in the book. And there's the third... That's the harlot, Mystery Babylon, the woman who rides the beast. Don't confuse the woman with the beast. She rides the beast. They're different, and we'll get, deal with that when we get there. So that's a quick look at what we talked about last time, with a little bit of a review. Let's get to the salutation and the occasion of the book. Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show in his service the things that must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. This is the John, that, the apostle John. He will show up five times in this, specifically referring to himself in this book. Who will bear record of the word of God, the testament of Jesus Christ, of all things he saw. And, uh, okay, and we took that, okay. John, it's, it's, it's like sort of a memo, from me to you. John, which, uh, 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 to the seven churches which are in Asia. The word Asia, by the way, is not the continent of Asia. You and I use the term to speak of the Far East. Here it's being used as a province of the Roman uh, Empire. The, provin the, the province of Asia, now we might call it Asia Minor, is essentially the western two-thirds of Turkey. So that was, that was a province in the Roman Empire called Asia. And he, John is writing to seven churches which are in Asia. It says, grace unto you and peace. That's a very common word to a Greek. You say grace, charis, very com comfortable greeting. And to a Jew, you might say shalom or peace. So they can be viewed as just comfortable salutations, but not in the Scripture, because each one is a profound theological statement. And I won't get into, from here we could launch into a whole sermonette on what do we mean by grace. And that's getting what we don't deserve, right? And there's a whole aspect to that. But also peace, the getting peace with God is what it's all about. We win and He wins in this uh, resolution. And, and, and uh, we could go through both of those terms. The easy way to do that is just pick up a commentary on the book of Romans and it'll go into all of that for you. But grace unto you and peace. From whom? From him which is and which was and which is to come. Who would that be? God. Okay, we'll leave it at that for the moment. From the spirit, seven spirits which are before his throne. We have the, from, from, him, from him which is and which was to come and from the seven spirits, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. And I'll go on in that in a minute. You have, you suspect right away that what you've got here, it sounds like the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? You've got Him which is, which was, and which is to come, which one can argue is God, God in general, or God the Father specifically. I'll get back to the seven spirits in a minute. And from Jesus Christ. Now, when you see Jesus Christ, who he is the faithful witness, first begotten of the dead. The print, here's three identifiers of Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness. He's the first begotten of the dead. And he's the prince of the kings of the earth. These are not only true and, and justify a great deal of discussion on each one that I'll spare you tonight, but you, I think they're self-evident. But I want you to notice that these labels are identified with Christ and will be used of him throughout the book. So later on in the book, when it says the faithful witness, or if it says the first begotten of the dead, or if it says the prince of kings of the earth, who is he talking about? Here's the linkage. If you're a computer programmer, this is like the data division. Usually in a program up front, you set up the identities, what you mean by various things that you're going to use later. This is exactly what's happening here. It's interesting that each of these phrases have three tenses, a past, present, and future. God, which was, which is, and which is to come. And each one of those are allusions from elsewhere in the New Testament. God which was is mentioned in Colossians 1 and John 8 and elsewhere, the other places. Then we have Jesus Christ. I said he's a faithful witness. That's past. That's been done. He's the first begotten of the dead. That's now. And he's coming in this book, the prince of the kings. There's a future. See, each one of these has a past, a present, and a future. Do you get the feeling? And obviously we take each one and elaborate, but your notes will have the verses. You can chase those down yourself, okay? 
Unto him that what? Loved us, washed us from our sins in his blood, and made us kings and priests. There again, it's past, he loved us. It's interesting that in the Bible, when God says, God loved us, past tense, so what do you mean past tense? He loves us now, absolutely. But when it says, he loved us past tense, what is it referring to? Anyone? Oh, oh I got you. What? What is? What? Right on. Gold star, absolutely, the crucifixion. That's a term, you'll notice it carefully, every time you find that God loved us, past tense, it's allusion to the cross, okay? Unto him that loved us, that's past, that washed us from our sins in his blood, that's today, every day, we're washed through the water by the word, according to Ephesians. And in the future, what's the book all going to show us here? He made us kings and priests. He's made us, but we become the kings and priests. So it's the past, present, and future. And then we're going to find, when we get to verse 19, the outline of the entire book is in the same tenses. Past tense, the things which you have seen. In other words, when you get there, it'll be, it will have been the visions of Christ. The things which are, that is the seven churches, and we'll come to that at the end of the day. And the things which shall be metatauta after these things. So again, we have past, present, and future. It may shock you to realize that there are these same three tenses, past, present, future, in your salvation. That may disturb some people. Well, I have been saved. What do you mean by that? I have been removed from the penalty of sin. It's a positional statement. I'm no longer subject to the penalty of sin. I have been saved, past tense. You with me so far? Okay. That technically would really be called justification, but I won't go down the theological path here. There's a present tense. I'm being saved every day. What do you mean by that? I'm saved from the power of sin. Past tense, penalty of sin. Present tense, power of sin. That's operational, moment by moment, by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by my flesh. The minute I lean on my flesh, I've blown it, <laughs> I sin. But if I'm walking moment by moment in the Spirit, then I'm being saved from the power of sin. That process, that continuing process is called sanctification. Okay? There's a third and that's, I shall be saved from the presence of sin, sometimes called the redemption of our body. So there's three tenses of being saved also. And you can get in a lot of trouble by being too absolute when you see the word saved. You can be saved from a burning building. It's got nothing to do with the subject we may be talking about. If I'm there. So there's three tenses. I'll leave you, leave you with that. The other thing I like to highlight is how important the subject is we're dealing with. You know, there's two major events in God's achievement list, and one is the creation of the universe, and the other is the redemption that we're dealing with here. Which one's more important? Well, how do you tell? Well, one way you can measure something is how much space in the Bible is, de is devoted to it. Well, space. You've got in, the, in the creation, you've got two chapters in Genesis, not bad. You've got a few Psalms and a few chapters in Job, several chapters in Isaiah, and that's about it. You've done it, pretty much. How many chapters are de de devoted to the redemption? The whole book of Genesis. Book of Exodus, Book of Leviticus, the whole Torah, in fact, Joshua, Ruth, the prophets, the gospel, they're all having to do with the, re with the redemption. The, all the epistles, that's what they're hammering. And of course, the book of Reve uh, Revelation is the climax, which is the reason I'm bringing this up. Well, another way to measure something, how important is it? What does it cost? Well, the price of the creation was breathed from his nostrils. He called it into existence. As astonishing as it is, as, maj as majestic as it is, it's something God could do, our vernacular would be with a snap of his fingers. What about the redemption? What did it cost him? Oh, ho, ho. it cost him his son. Heard a recent message by Joe Foch that really moved me. He had a son that was badly in need of emergency treatment in the hospital and uh, full of blood, and I won't go through the details, but he gets the emergency and they didn't, they weren't ready to deal with him right away and as his father, he had a fit. He explained to them that if they didn't deal with him right now, they're going to need emergency care. <laughs> and he, he recounted the pain of a father seeing his son. We had, you know, Gary had a situation like that here among our sons and so forth. What Joe Foch did, he presented the creation of uh, the uh, crucifixion from the father's point of view. I never heard that, never thought about that before. You know, as a father... You'd gladly trade places with your son as they spit on him, as they ramrod him through six illegal trials, 
and you go through the whole crucifixion from the Father's point of view that he forbear intervening. Why? For you and me. For you and me. But can you imagine the agony of the Father seeing his son put through that? Anyway, let's move on. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, which is to come, the seven spirits. We took the first and third. We didn't take this other one. I personally believe that the seven spirits are an idiom of the Holy Spirit, an Old Testament phrase of the Old Holy Spirit. There are other people of different views. They suspect the seven spirits are the seven angels. The seven spirits which are... Th there are prominently seven angels mentioned. There are seven churches each have an angel. We're not talking about them, I don't believe. But the seven trumpets and the seven bowls will be administered by seven angels. And there's some people that see those seven angels as the key players. And they may be right, but uh, 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 I personally notice in Isaiah chapter 11 is that we have the sevenfold Holy Spirit mentioned there. Uh, the spirit of yad heh vav -Heh, the uh, shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, spirit of might, spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of fear of the Lord. There's seven elements. And there are a number of us, not, not, not universal, but a number of us that, that see that as the sevenfold expression of the Holy Spirit. There are others that argue that these the last six are in three pairs and that this really represents something else and so they may be right. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll leave that with you. But there, I, I'm intrigued that there are in fact seven elements there and it's a sevenfold and that also makes that thing a, a, a allusion to the Trinity. But moving on, unto him that loved us, washed us from, his, from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. This is John finishing his salutation that opens his letter. But he uses this, it makes an interesting remark here, that he hath made us kings and priests. We're going to make a big thing of that when we get to chapter five, 4 and 5. Because there are only three people that are kings and priests. You may recall all through Israel, the kings were of the tribe of Judah, the priests from the tribe of Levi. And they were to stay separate. A couple of occasions they were crossing that line, it was a no-no. Kings and priests in Israel were separate Mandates. There are only three people in the Bible that are both. Melchizedek is singled out in Genesis 14 and, and uh, elaborated in, the, in, the, in a couple of places in the uh, Psalms. And then uh, the book of Hebrews makes a big thing of that Melchizedek was a king and a priest. Very unique. The only other, in fact, the other one is Jesus Christ. He's a king and a priest. There's a third. And that's identified right here. You and I, if we're believers in Christ, have made us kings and priests. And that's going to be an important identity piece forthcoming. So I call to your attention now. Then John continued, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Sounds like an echo from Zechariah 12, 10, and so forth. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Do I hear an amen? Amen. <laughs> amen. Okay, good. And I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Boy, I love that. Love that. Book of Revelation <laughs> will we'll, uh, deal in superlatives in every direction. And the ultimate superlative is His Majesty. I am Alpha and Omega. I think most of you realize Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega, the last letter. In the Hebrew, you'd say the Aleph and the Tau. In the English, you'd say the A and the Z, but the same, you get the idea. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Now John starts, the, that was all by his opening breath. Verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and in patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is the occasion he calls attention. It's John. He's going to refer to himself five times um, in, in this book alone. Uh, there was fashionable, some scholars have tried to attack the, the, the authorship of John, but it, that, that is easily shredded. It's very clear. Uh, competent scholars agree. There's no doubt that, that he wrote it and so forth. So we have to waste time on that issue. Um, John, of course, was born of Bethsaida to Zebedee and Salome. He, had a, he was the, uh, probably the younger of two brothers. Um, 
And uh, they were fairly well off. Salome ends up being a major financier of, of Christ's ministry later on. Uh, they were Galilean, uh, uh, John was a Galilean fisherman like his father. In fact, he was in partners with his brother and with Peter and Andrew in a fishing business. They even had um, servants, so it was not a trivial enterprise. And so uh, 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 he was an early disciple of John the Baptist to begin with. And of course, uh, something else about John most people don't realize, he apparently was very well connected, not only to come from a, 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 a non-trivial family financially, but he also knew the high priest and also knew Nicodemus somehow. So he's, he's apparently comfortable with these people. He's, so he's well connected for whatever reasons. He also turns out to be one of the inner circle of Jesus Christ. There were 12 disciples, but three of them were really insiders in a very special way. Three of them, Peter, James, and John. Peter and the two brothers, James and John, were at the Mount Transfiguration. We'll talk a little bit about that t t today again. They were also the three that were allowed in when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter uh, in Matthew 9. The three of them... And Andrew, along with them, were the, were the ones that Jesus gave a confidential briefing on a second coming to, called the Olivet Discourse. And also the three of them were closer to Jesus. In Gethsemane, they were all the disciples were there, but three went closer with Jesus as he went a little further. And so you, you really get the, if you watch your Gospels, you see a number of places where James, Peter, James, and John are, uh, are the closest th uh, uh, three to the Lord. And of course, John, this is interesting, John, Jesus assigns the care of his mother, not to his brothers, he had several of them, but to the apostle John. And uh, that becomes uh, important to us. He wrote, and John, I believe, wrote a letter to her that you have in your Bibles. It's called Second John. Read it and come to your own conclusions. And John, ultimately, after this event of Patmos, he was on Patmos because of Domitian, but then when Domitian dies, he's released, and he goes to Ephesus and, and uh, sets things in order and then retires. Now, if you look at a map between, in other words, west of Turkey, but east of, of Greece is the Aegean Sea, and there's a little island there that's really part of Turkey today called Patmos. And if we zero in on that a little better, about 24 miles offshore, um, the... Uh, 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 for, well, 24 miles, I should say, from, uh, from the coast of Turkey. It's about 40 miles from Miletus, which is the port side of the peninsula from Ephesus, is this island, this island called uh, Patmos. If you're, if you're from California, you spend any time on Catalina, it's very, very similar, both in shape, in agriculture, and in distance from, the, from you know, one's 24, one's 26, but let's not quibble. It, it's, it's all, Catalina's also sort of crescent-shaped and, and it's very similar if you spent time there. But anyway, that's Patmos, and uh, an, a penal colony at the time. And uh, so he was exiled by Domitian, which means he wrote the book apparently about 96 AD. This is an important thing. Many so-called scholars will try to tell you it was written a lot earlier than that because they have their axe to grind. Turns out you can pretty well demonstrate it was written um, uh, at the end of the first century. Very late in John's life, very late in that century. John leads, uh, lives... Uh, uh, be pretty old. Uh, Domitian is the brother of Titus, who's uh, the one that destroyed Jerusalem. Um, Hippolytus has, uh, spreads this rumor that he's first plunged in boiling oil and then sent to the island of exile. That's just one of these traditions or legends that's pretty well disputed by most serious scholars. Victor Ernest says that he was forced to work in the mines located in Patmos. I could not find any evidence of mines on Patmos. I think that's another one of these traditions that show up. But Irenaeus, Clement, and Eusebius. Uh, all point out that after Domitian dies, um, that uh, and Trajan takes over, that uh, John returns to Ephesus, sets the churches in order, and he retires there. He really retires there. Okay. Now we get into verse 10 and 11. John starts the narrative. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Well, let's take this apart. First of all, on what day of the week did, was, was uh, John in the Spirit to receive this thing? And if you say Sunday, you flunk. Good for you. We don't know that it was Saturday, but it's a better answer. We don't know the day of the week. Everybody assumes, many scholars even jump to the conclusion that when he says, I'm in the Spirit on the Lord's day, that that's what he's talking about. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, is Sunday the Lord's Day? Most of us, 
if you've been in the medieval church or the remnant after that church, after a thousand years of indoctrination, assume that Sunday's the Lord's day. The, the Sabbath, the Shabbat, was ordained in Eden in Genesis chapter 2. Shabbat was observed before the law was given. In Exodus 16, when the manna falls, they gather it on every day except Shabbat. That's interesting because that's Exodus 16. The law was given, the Ten Commandments and all that, in Exodus chapter 20, four chapters later. The point I'm getting at is the, the Shabbat, the, uh, the observation of the Sabbath, was ordained before the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments say, remember the Sabbath day. It's simply incorporating that practice into the Ten. We know from Daniel 7 verse 25 that the spirit of the Antichrist, if not the Antichrist personally, will seek to change the times and the laws. How interesting. Now, if you look at a modern calendar, and I have a picture here, one of this year from Europe, and uh, it's interesting on this calendar that it starts on Monday, first day of the week. And it, they do that to make Sunday the seventh day of the week. Really? That's kind of interesting. You mean that Monday's the first day of the week and Sunday is the seventh day of the week? I didn't know that. Neither did the writer of the Bible. Because upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher. What day was that? Easter Saturday? No. We call it Easter Sunday, right? And that's not just in Matthew 28, 1. It's Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20. It is one of those few things that's recorded in all four Gospels. No, we need to understand that from the beginning, the, um, uh, the, the Lord's appointed day, by his own definition, all through the Torah is uh, Shabbat, the seventh day. That's when the Lord himself rested and he honors that day and he calls that day an appointment with him. Well, we don't have to keep the Sabbath. You're right. You don't have to keep the Sabbath, I guess. But it's his appointment. You're going to miss it? <laughs> it's up to you. But anyway, so uh, that, that's why many people get concerned about that. Now, it's interesting the Bible says many places, do not move the ancient landmarks. I never associated that with the seventh day until a rabbi pointed that out to me. That's kind of interesting. That's a very fundamental landmark that we tend to move. I'll point out something else if you say, well, that changed, uh, that, you know, that, that, that changed when Christ rose from the dead. Well, that's interesting because the Lord gets back and sets up himself in the millennial temple, according to Ezekiel. The millennial temple will only be open on Saturday. Not on Sunday. On Saturday, and you've checked that out in Ezekiel 46, verse 1. On Sabbath and also on the new moon. On the month, the new moon. So, now, gee, Chuck, what are you saying? We shouldn't worship on Sunday? No, you can worship any day you like. For a Christian, every day is holy. And we, on, we worship, those that worship on Sunday, worship to celebrate the Lord's resurrection. Not knocking it. Not knocking it. But... Um, what we're supposed to do is show his death until he comes. There's a resurrection validates the death, but anyway, we could go down that path if you like. But anyway, um, Paul does seem to take us off the hook. He says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So don't let it become a big division. But that what Nan and I try to do is uh, observe in our own simple way, Shabbat. From Friday night through uh, sundown Friday to sundown uh, Saturday, we, we have three rules. Whatever we do, we do deliberately. And we do together, rule two. And the third rule is there are no other rules. <laughs> My kind of deal. And uh, so worship when you like. Don't let it be a point of division. But it's interesting, the more you, anyone that thinks it's a simple issue hasn't studied it. It's, it's worthy, your own individual study, come to your own conclusions. But John says, I was in the Spirit, obviously on the day of the Lord on Patmos, but he also says it in three other occasions, before the throne in chapter 4, when he's carried away in the wilderness in chapter 17, and then on a big mountain in chapter 21. We'll deal with that when we get there. Now, the, the, verse 11 says, he says, I am an alpha, Jesus said, I am an alpha and omega, the first and the last. I want to come back to that phrase in a little bit. What thou seest, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, 
to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. It's interesting that the entire book of Revelation is like a cover letter that is then sent, I mean, it's sent with a cover letter to seven churches. So it wasn't one church, it was these seven all got a copy. The seven churches, which are in Asia, again, that's the province of Asia, and uh, they're not the only seven churches in the province of Asia. Some scholars say they were, that's not true. Yeah, where uh, Laodicea was right virtually adjacent to Colossae and Hierapolis, all of which are mentioned in the Bible. That valley has three. Why weren't the others mentioned? Why these seven? We're going to come to that. Seven churches. We'll come to that later. Let's go to the verses 12 to 18. This is a core part of chapter 1. We touched on it lightly last time. Let's go ahead a little more carefully. The vision of the risen Christ. John says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. The one that said, I am Alpha Omega, was a voice behind him, apparently. He turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Or putting another way, across the chest with a golden uh, breastplate kind of thing. Okay. Seven lampstands. Um, who is the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. That term is used of Him uh, again and again in the Scripture. And uh, I encourage you to take a concordance, chase it down yourself. We could spend an hour just talking about not only that phrase, what it means, but also the way it's used in the Scripture. Uh, the book of Luke's primary focus on, is on that very issue. But here we actually see a, a, a description of the risen Christ. We see the risen Christ in the Gospels when He raises from the dead. He has breakfast there on the Sea of Galilee. We don't get a description of Him. But here we do. We see Him. He's clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the, the, the vest or the, with, uh, with a, a golden apparatus of some kind. And we get more. His hair, His head and His hairs were white like wool. It's white as snow. Here we have not only the visual, but also the implication of purity. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Watch out for that word as and like. It's such and such as like this or such and such as as. That means they're using a simile. You know what a simile is? A metaphor is like a simile without the as and like. They're a little more difficult, but they're still figures of speech. But when you have the as or like, you don't even have to guess. You know it's a figure of speech. His eyes weren't a flame. His, his eyes were as a flame of fire. And, and uh, indeed. So, and his feet, like unto fine brass. It doesn't say they were brass. They were like brass. But the image here is as if they burned in a furnace. So they're molten bright, if you will. And his voice, as the sound of many waters. I think there's an interesting contrast here when you study Elijah. Remember how he heard the voice of God? It wasn't in the hurricane. It wasn't the wind. It wasn't the word. It was in a still, small voice. And I think some of us often hear Christ speak, or God speak to us in that still, small voice. We're not talking about that here. <laughs> it's a roar of a mighty ocean. His voice like the sound of many waters. But let's take this term brass. What I'm going to show you here is the kind of thing I want you to do with your own concordance. One of your most powerful commentaries in the book of Revelation is not somebody's commentary, although I don't discourage you from getting those, but is to get a strong concordance or even, or even some better ones. Get a, get a concordance and when you find a word like brass, you can find out every place it appears in the Bible and you can see how it's used to see what it means. You'll also discover for many of these things the law of first mention where it's first mentioned is often very, very important. But let's just take this word brass. That should remind you of this strange episode in Numbers 21. You may recall that the Lord sent fiery, according to, starting at verse 6, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. There's a preamble here why God is doing this, but I'm going to set that aside for now. These serpents are killing people. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So they're getting an, a judgment. They understand why they're getting it, apparently. And so, but can you, can you, can you stop this thing? And so Me Moses prayed for the people. Okay? Now God has lots of different ways he could deal with it. He could make the serpents go away. He could just stop. There's all kinds of ways you can imagine. He does something weird. 
Really weird. The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery brazen, turns out what, serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, come on, that's pretty weird. You're grateful that he did it, but you've got to be asking yourself, what on earth is that all about? A, a serpent is a symbol of sin. A brass serpent on a pole up on a hill, if I look at that, I'm cured. That's got to be weird. But here's the point that further. You can read the rest of the Old Testament and not get an answer on this thing. What's this all about? In fact, when you get to the days of Hezekiah, that brass serpent is still hanging around and people are worshiping it. So Hezekiah takes it and destroys it. It's a thing of brass. See, you, say, you have the same danger with the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin is dangerous if it's real. I don't know if it's real or not. Some people think it is. If it is, it's dangerous. Why? Because people will start to look to it rather than God or Jesus or whatever. But here we are, the whole test. we go all the way to the end of the Old Testament. This makes no sense until that night with Nicodemus when Jesus says something to Jesus. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus who's a ruler. He was the teacher of the people, by the way. He was the top, top teacher at that time. Jesus says to him, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have eternal life. Suddenly, the fog lifts. Oh, that's why God put a serpent on a pole, because it's a type, an emblem in advance of the cross. Did they know that in the days of Moses? I don't think so. They may have had some suspicions. He may have had some insights not recorded. But it makes no sense until Jesus explains it to you. You with me? Not only that, this phrase that Jesus said here sets up the most important verse, the most well-known verse of the Bible. The next verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How often we quote that. That's verse 16, the, the previous verse 14 and 15. For God so loved, there again, past tense, how did he love us? That he gave his son, his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 16, John 3, 16. We all know it. That's the kind. But it's interesting, until that episode, there's no way you can make sense of this brazen serpent. I mention that not just because of the point it's making. There's another lesson here. That's what we would call a macro code. It's a code in the numbers that anticipates something that hasn't happened yet. You see? The design of that <coughs> emblem in Numbers 21 required the designer to be outside the dimensionality of time who could see the end from the beginning. Do you follow me? The Bible is full of those. Some so obvious you miss them. That's one of them. Okay, let's move on. It, this had its start, by the way, in Genesis 3. Remember what God said when God is declaring war on Satan? He says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman. That is the Satan and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The word bruise there is a mistranslation. That word is shuf, which can mean bruise or crush. Well, let's move it back to Revelation 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. He had his right hand seven stars. No problem with that one. We'll get to that in a minute anyway. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. You know, there are paintings in art museums of Jesus Christ with a flaming sword coming out of his mouth. The picture is actually quite grotesque because they took that literally. Well, Chuck, don't you take the Bible literally? Yes, I do, but that's a figure of speech. Let me prove it to you. What is a two-edged sword in the Scripture? Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick that is alive, is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Therein lies the frustration of the whole field of psychology because they can't discern between soul and spirit. No way. It can't possibly be done. 
They can do what they want with the soul, but they can't discern the spirit because it says so. And there's a lot of other reasons they can't. Anyway, the point is, the, 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 only, the only word of God makes that discernment. And uh, to edge sword again. Let's go to Ephesians 6. Take the helmet of salvation. You remember the seven elements of armor? All right. Take the helmet of salvation and what? The sword of the Spirit. What's the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. Right. And Revelation, he had in his right hand seven stars. I was about with a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance, his face, was, was as, as again, the simile coming, was as the sun shineth in his strength. Well, wait a minute. When did that happen in the past? John would remember when that happened in the past. Okay, his countenance was as the sun. In Matthew 16, they were, he says, verily, uh, let's we'll start with the last verse of Matthew 16. He says, Verily I say unto you, there shall be some standing here that shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That ends chapter 16. Many people wonder, when did that happen? That's because you forget those chapter divisions are man's convenience, not part of the, Verse 17, chapter 17 says, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as what? The sun. Exactly. And his raiment was white as light. The transfiguration of Christ is, I believe, what it's talking about. So his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. What does John do in Revelation verse seven, chapter 1, verse 17? And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. That's a strange phrase. We encountered it back in verse 11. I didn't want to stumble over it then. We'll pick it up now. The first and the last. This is worth jotting some notes down, okay? For lots of reasons. But one of the things, you will have your door, someone will knock on your door. I don't know if they'll be riding bicycles, but they'll knock on your door. And they will want to talk to you about Jehovah God. And uh, if they do, you take them initially to Isaiah 41, verse 4, where Isaiah t- says, who hath, speaking of God, who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I am the Lord, the first and the last, I am He. You say, who is that? Well, that's, that's, that's Jehovah God. They're lit, lit up because you understand that's Jehovah God. Good, okay. Take them to Isaiah 44, 6. Thus saith the Lord God, the Lord, the King of Israel, His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Beside me, there is no God. Who's that? Well, that's Jehovah God. They're with you now. They're, you're locked arm in arm. One more. Isaiah 48, 12. Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel. My called, I am He, I am the first, and I also am the last. You say, who's that? Right now they're getting kind of, well, that's, well, come on, that's all, the Jehovah God. Good. Then you go to their favorite book. They love the book of Revelation, right? And you come down to verse 17, I, I, I fell at his feet dead and laid out his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Say, who is that? Well, that's Jehovah God. It had to be. Same guy, right? Okay. And you go to verse uh, well, 11 I talked about. We mentioned that before. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, so forth. And then you get to um, verse 8. I usually save this one for last. On the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Whoops. Who's that? And you can't escape that that's Jesus Christ. He obviously died and rose from the dead, but he's also the same guy, the first and the last. He is Jehovah God in their, in their vernacular. And uh, we go to uh, verse chapter 22. Uh, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And there it is again. The one that bothers them, of course, is chapter 2, verse 8, which is dead and alive. They all stumble on that one unless they have a twist that they can throw at you. So we've got this mentioned four, three times in Isaiah, four times in Revelation. How many times do you see first and the last? Anyone want to guess? <laughs> Seven. Okay? All right. And it's interesting that two of them, verse 18 and verse uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 8, he was dead and am alive. That's his boast. That's his identity. The risen Lord. Okay. So we looked at the vision of chapter 1. It's got seven features. The hair on his head we, is, is a, virtually a quote from Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. Hair as white as wool and all that business. Okay. His eyes is a flaming fire. Okay. That's all through the New Testament. At least four, uh, three times in the New Testament, once in the Old Testament. His feet, which is a symbol of his walk, right? Brass, judgment, we talked about that. The brazen serpent, we, you can put your notes on that. 
His voice of many waters is a phrase used twice by Ezekiel, once by Daniel in chapter 10. His, on his right hand are seven stars and seven lampstands. In the, it's interesting. We're going to talk more about these stars and lampstands, but notice something strange. They're in his hand, and yet he's in the midst of them. I don't think you can draw that, but you can understand it. You see, we are in his hand, in his protection, and yet he, he's among us. Where two or three are gathered, he's among us, right? His mouth, two-edged sword, we covered that. But it, what his mouth does, it, it judges the unbeliever in John 12. It smites the earth in Isaiah 11. And the Antichrist is consumed by his word, by the words of his mouth in 2 Thessalonians 2. So his mouth is a non-trivial instrument of war. His countenance is the sun. That gives you seven of those. Okay. Okay, now we get to the verse that's going to be very important to you. You want to really understand this verse if you're going to understand the book of Revelation. And that's chapter 1, verse 19. He, John is instructed to write the things which thou hast seen. No problem. What had he seen by verse 19? He'd seen the risen Lord. He saw the vision of Christ. That's what he had seen. Write what you had seen. He just did. Chapter 1. The things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. See, we've got past, present, and future tense structure here again. Okay, write the things which thou hast seen. That's the vision of Christ, which occupies the bulk of chapter 1. Write the things which are, the things which are existing right now. That'll turn out to be chapters 2 and 3. There are seven churches that are going to receive seven letters. And I'm going to suggest to you right up front that the most important part of this entire book is chapters 2 and 3. Chapters 4 on have a lot of fascinating insights and material. Don't misunderstand me. But you're going to watch that from the mezzanine, I believe. I'll show you why I believe that. But the part that affects you and me today, tomorrow, and next week, whatever, is chapter 2 and 3. You need to understand. You may not be able to figure out who the trumpets are, what the bowls are, what these strange creatures in chapter 9 are about. You don't care. Because you'll watch that from the mezzanine, from a rooting section. No, the part that affects us is chapters 2 and 3. Because after, and then we have that which follows after the churches. And uh, so we're going to focus primarily on chapters 2 and 3 in the next several sessions. And that then leads to the last verse of chapter 1, the preparation for chapters 2 and 3. Mystery, uh, 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 Jesus continues, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. Colon. It's not even a complete sentence. It's sort of a title in an introductory title. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. You with me so far? Okay. Question. Where are the lampstands in chapter 1 right now? In, this, in the imagery of, the, of, of, of chapter 1. Where are they? On the earth. You got it. You're going to find them in heaven in chapter 4. Many people overlook that. It's not a big proof. I'll show you some other things that make it more con conclusive. But just understand the consistency here. And the seven lampstands represent... Why lampstands? Because they are light bearers. What's the church's mission? To bear the light. The Israel was supposed to bear the light. That's why the menorah is today the symbol of Israel. Not the Star of David on their flag. That's an emblem. Fine. The official symbol of the state of Israel is the menorah, the seven branch candlestick. Why? Well, for lots of reasons, not the least of which, it represents their mission to be a light to the world. They were intended to be the proclaimers of the, of the, of the Creator and the Redeemer. Here we have seven lampstands, seven churches. Are there more than seven churches? Of course. There are dozens of churches. One of the assignments I want you to think about between now and the next session why these seven? If you're a student, I'd have you make a list of the churches in the New Testament that are not. You'll come to 20 or 30 of them that aren't mentioned. Where's the church in Jerusalem? The church at Rome? The church at Antioch was the primary base camp for the proclamation of the gospel of the Gentiles. Not mentioned here. And you're gonna, you mentioned, you'll, you'll think of a lot. of Lystra, Derby, there's a bunch of them. Why these seven? We'll talk about that. Okay. Seven churches, the things which are. Why these seven? Each letter has a peculiar phrase in it. There's one phrase, only one phrase, that occurs in each of the seven letters. It's a closing phrase to the letter. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
By the time you go through chapters 2 and 3, you'll be tired of hearing that, so to speak. Okay? Because it's there on every letter. There, I'm going to suggest to you, for your own confirmation, you figure it out for yourself, but there are four levels of interpretation or application of these seven letters. The first is they are local. They really were churches operating at that time. In fact, Sir William Ramsey conducted an intensive archaeological investigation, skeptically at first, totally convinced when he was finished, that these churches not only were actually existed, they had local problems that the letters were relevant to. And we'll talk about some of that as we go through the four letters, or seven letters. But they, had, they were literal churches in John's day that needed the Lord's counsel. Okay, that one's a no-brainer. Were you got it so far? Okay. They're, I'm going to suggest they're admonitory to all churches. Notice what the, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. See, all seven letters were sent to all seven churches. Yes, one was addressed to Ephesus, but they were all supposed to read and learn from it. Another was addressed to, you see, you follow me? Churches is in the plural, which means, he that, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. They're all supposed to watch all of them. You got it? So there must be lessons there, appropriate, to the churches in general. And we can suspect that since there's seven churches, in some sense, they embrace all churches. Once you learn those seven letters in depth, you can profile every church in terms of percentages. Every church has some elements of all seven letters, even the uncomplimentary ones. But different churches, have, they're, oh, this one, there's 70% X and only 10% Y. You, know, you follow what I'm saying? The, the, the seven become a sevenfold space in which you can map any church. Some good, some bad. They're all there. So it's important to understand. They're report cards. Okay. But this phrase also says, he that hath an ear. How many of you in this room have an earlobe? Can I see a show of hands? <laughs> then this letter, these letters, all of them are written to you. I know Philadelphia's written to me. But no, what about the others? Okay. <laughs> okay. So they're homiletic. That is, they're personally, they're, uh, uh, they're intended for personal application. This is not something I'm contriving. That's embraced in the very language of the letters. We tend to overlook it because they're addressed to a particular church. No, it's addressed to the church you're going to, whichever it is, in some degree. And it's also addressed to you personally. Personally. So you see why this becomes the most important part of the entire book. Okay? But now there's a fourth part that I hope you will take it skeptically at first, but I'm going to suggest before it's over, you may be absolutely stunned with the next one. And that is, these seven letters will outline a profile of 2,000 years of church history. You say, Chuck, that's speculation. Yes, it is. It's conjecture, in part. But you'll be able to make your own conclusions before we're through. But I'll point this right up front. If the letters were in any other order, that wouldn't be true. In the order that they're in, once you understand them, they lay out the history of the church on the planet Earth. Now, I know some people say, well, the church, you know, the old story about the, the, uh, the elder that comes to the pastor says, they're chewing gum in the sanctuary. The pastor says, no, no, the sanctuaries are chewing gum. In other words, we are. And yes, the church, you know, we're, we're the temple of God and all that. Yes, but here the term church is being used for these geographical churches. Churches as we tend to use the term, not as buildings, but as uh, assemblies that are in various locations. Okay. Okay. Now, is there a prophetic profile? We've got Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I'm going to suggest before it's over that each one of these churches have a, not only a history, a future. And that future is reflected in the letters in a way that's astonishing. The more you know about this, the more astonishing it'll become. So that's my challenge to you, because between now and next session, I want you to read your general assignment is to read the entire book of Revelation between each meeting. It's not that long. Don't, bur don't groan. But I certainly want you to read chapters 2 and 3, all, both chapters, before next session, for some reasons. But I want you to really understand the first seven verses of chapter 2. But we'll get... You're going to discover that each of the seven letters has seven... How many, de how many design elements would be in each letter? Make a guess. Seven. Good guess. Good guess. 
the name of the church will turn out to be meaningful to the letter. What a coincidence. <laughs> the title Christ uses of himself is relevant to the letter. Not when you first read it, when you understand the letter and you go back, you realize Jesus chose of the many titles of himself, he picks the one that particularly relates to the problems in that church. You follow me? There is, it's a report card. There's a commendation. You did these things well. Well done here, 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 and here. Great, good, good, well done. Then he has the concerns. Whoops, you got to work on this area or that area. It's a report card. Then there's an exhortation. It's obviously consistent with that. Here's what I want you to do. Here's your remedial assignment, right? And then there's a promise to the overcomer. Each letter has this little, uh, you know, promise to the overcomer. The overcomer will get this or that, some, something special. Each one's different. Each one, there's seven different ones. And then he has this, clo this peculiar closing, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. These seven elements are the seven basic elements of all seven letters. Here's the thing that makes it a little complicated. You'll discover that in the first three letters, the close, the promise to the overcomer is not in the letter, it's in a postscript. It comes after the letter is finished. That's kind of weird. And it's consistent in the first three letters. Why? In the last four letters, the promise to the overcomer is in the body of the letter. What's that got to do with anything? Um, you'll also discover two of the letters have nothing good said about them. <gasps> Whoops. Two of the letters have nothing bad said about them. That's wild. But here's the more important part. Every one of the recipients of all seven was surprised. The guys that thought they were doing well weren't. The guys that thought they weren't doing well were. And the lesson is that we don't really have the ability to second guess our own report card. Let's find out what, how Christ's report card reads of our church, or more specifically, us personally. That's why we're going to get into this with some substance. So we have these church's report cards, seven of them, and uh, we'll talk about each of the names, and we'll talk about each of the uh, um, titles that Christ uses, each one's different, and we'll go through each one of these, and we'll also obviously deal with the structure when we get there. Now, to just back up and wrap it up, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. The Old Testament closes with unfulfilled prophecies, unappeased longings, and so forth. The Old Testament is incomplete in itself. And what it lacks is right there in, in the New Testament. And we believe it's prophetic. Over 8,000, according to one categorization by J. Parton Bain, his Encyclopedia Biblical Prophecy, he catalogs over 8,000 predictive verses in the Bible on almost 2,000 predictions on over 700 different matters. And we live in a day where there are major themes unfolding. Israel, Jerusalem, the Temple, Babylon, Russia or Magog, the rise of China, the European superstate, ecumenicalism, the move towards the global government, the rise of the occult. These are all trends that are clearly converging to a climax and each one of them is mappable in terms of Bible prophecy. And that's why I always like to throw this up as a challenge. One last challenge. You've heard me before, but I'll put it up again. And if you accept the challenge I put on the screen, you flunk the course. I want you to skeptically attack or challenge this preposterous assertion that you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's absurd. More than the gospel period? Yes. I believe you and I are, going to be, are being plunged into a period of time. The Bible says more than it does even about the gospel period. Now, to challenge that audacious statement, you've got to do two things. You've got to find out what the Bible says. Not what Chuck Missler says or your favorite prophecy club or whatever. What the Bible says. Find out what it says. Part one. Part two. Used to be hard, not today. Find out what's going on. You won't on the 10 o'clock news, even on Fox News. You've got to do better than that. Find out what's really happening. On the internet, talk radio, proprietary news, there's all kinds of ways, all kinds of resources available. Find out what the Bible says, find out what's going on. And the more you know about the Bible and the more you know about what's really going on in the world, the more you'll observe 
the convergence of these things into the ultimate climax. But the ultimate issue is that you and I are in fact in possession of a message of extraterrestrial origin. We'll see that manifestly in the book of Revelation. It portrays us as both the participants and the objects of an unseen and invisible cosmic warfare. Whether you know it or not, you are in it, in the middle of it. You're on enemy turf tonight. And our, yours and mine, your eternal destiny and mine depends on our relationship with the ultimate victor in that conflict. But I peeked ahead. We win. <laughs> and where do, you, where do you stand with respect to him? That's what it's really all about. Now for the next session, here are your assignments. Read the entire book. It's not that book. And I want you, by rereading it, rereading it, grasp the, the, an overview. of it. It's really a symphony. It's very... Uh, interwoven. Examine chapters 2 and 3 because that's going to be the primary uh, area of inquiry over the next few sessions. Outline the first seven verses of chapter 2 if you can. I've given you the outline. I've given you seven elements. Structure them. Just, just write out the verses but part, part, uh, you know, partition them in terms of those seven elements. And, you, and as I'm asking you to summarize the Ephesians which is the first of the seven letters, the, book of, uh, the letter to the uh, church at Ephesus. Summarize their report card. And we'll go into Acts 20 and some other background as we look at that next time. Acts 20, you want to read Acts 20 verses 16 through 38. That was the middle to the end of the chapter. And you may also want to take a look at Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. It's one of the most rewarding of all the epistles. Sometimes when I'm in an airport and I've got a few minutes before the plane goes and I'm not sure what else to do, I'll just pop my Bible and read the book of Ephesians. There's a couple I use, that's just, that's right up there, because I know no matter what my mind's been on, what other hassles I've had, that pulls me out of it, and it is so high-flying. It is so awesome. And there are so many subtle surprises in that book, that letter. So I encourage you, six chapters is no big deal. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.